Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to this Skill Up session brought to you by PeopleCert. My name is Cody, and I'd love to welcome you back to this learning experience on IDLE. Uh, today, we have a lot to cover, but before we get things going, I do have just a couple of housekeeping notes I'd like to review. First off, today's session is being recorded. So if you miss any of our discussion, if you'd like to rewatch at a later time, or if you'd like to share with your team, you will be receiving an email with a link to access the recording on demand. If you'd like to engage with us today, and, and we'd really love your, your contributions to our conversation, there are a couple of ways for you to do so. The first option is on the right side of your screen, and it is the chat tab. So if you see that chat tab, go ahead and let us know from where in the world you are joining us. Now, if you have any specific questions for us, we do want you to submit those to the Q&A. Sending in your questions to the Q&A helps us keep track of your questions, and we want to be sure to weave as many as we can into our conversation. Um, so be sure to send those in. Um, additionally, if you jump to the handouts section, you'll see there's a link for next week's, pro next week's session titled um, How Service Management Helps Drive Sustainability. Um, so be sure to check out that handout if you want to join us for our next session. Um, so our conversation today is on how project management drives digital transformation. And I'm joined by Adrian van Reekman, Senior Principal Success Architect at ServiceNow. David Tomlinson, also known as Tomo. He is a Senior Learning Specialist at QA Limited. We have Matt Barron, Senior Product Marketing Specialist at Invigate. And leading our conversation today is Helen Beal, Chair of the Value Stream Management Consortium. So Adrian, David, Matt, and Helen, thank you all so much for joining us. Helen, do you want to get this conversation started? I sure do. Thank you, Cody. And welcome, everybody. You look lovely and chatting. My goodness, we've got people from all over the world today. Tunisia, India, Pakistan, South Africa, my personal favorite, Costa Rica, Nigeria, England, where I'm from. Uganda, the Philippines, all over the world. So that is very exciting. Um, you've heard a little bit about your panellists today, but I think it's probably worth hearing a little bit more about them. As Cody just said, we're going to be talking about how service management drives digital transformation. So, Tomo, why don't you kick us off by telling the audience a little bit more about yourself and your experiences and journeys in the service management space? Well, it marks uh, uh, four decades since I had my first service management job as my first ever job was in a university and they said, answer the phone in the IT department. And I now realize that meant I was on the service desk. <laughs> I didn't know at the time. I just answered the phone and I had to do three things. Firstly, if it was a password reset, I had to put people through to Bob. Bob reset all passwords. I've never known what happened when he went on holiday, but there we go. Secondly, um, they lost their printout. No problem. Add it to the list to do tonight. Not a problem. And the third one, I thought, what am I going to do? I'm 17. What do I know? They said, tell them we're dealing with it and put the phone down. I now know that's called having full coverage observability. In other words, we knew it was going wrong before they did. And now we've spent the last 40 years getting back to where we used to be, watching flashing boards of lights uh, and knowing what's going on. So, uh, Helen, what goes around comes around. And I find ourselves relearning the lessons that we had from two decades before as a fairly constant uh, theme. Well, I do hope you find we've made some progress. <laughs> um, what about you, Matt? Um, what's your journey look like? Started off in customer service doing um, call center work. So much like Tamo, stuck me on the phones and uh, moved pretty quickly into enterprise service desk from there. And I just happened to be joining the industry at the same time that a, a particular uh, platform, ServiceNow, was becoming very popular. And so rode that train for about 12 years, doing implementations and lots of different experiences, consulting, process consulting, and now moved on to the dark side, joined a vendor and trying to give ServiceNow a run for their money. That <laughs> brings us, I think, very nicely to Adrian. Yeah, very nice, Matt. Um, started in, in the IT in 1989 uh, in a operations in the data center. And then in 1992, I was voluntold that I was gonna be the contingency manager for uh, that organization. So my first introduction to IT uh, service management, ITIL, and been in that space uh, ever since. Um, originally started in the Netherlands, moved to the US in 2001, 
uh, and doing a lot of uh, training um, and consulting. So a lot of experience of, of a lot of times of how not to do things, right? I, I, you meet so many people through your training and on your consulting gigs and all I see most of the times when I start my, my engagement is this is not how you do it, right? Doesn't mean that there's one right way to do it. There's many ways to do it right, but there's a lot of ways to, to not do it right. So um, now with uh, the organization that Matt tries to beat, um, but it's a, it's a healthy uh, uh, competition. There's enough room for everybody. So welcome, um, exactly. yeah, I'm happy to be here. Yes, competition is good, keeps everyone on their toes and it drives innovation, doesn't it? Yeah. So um, when I graduated from university about 1995 and started my career in IT, the internet was just emerging. And really that was the trigger for the digital transformation we're talking about today. So I think we could safely say that we live in a digital economy now and the prediction that Mark Anderson met around, or made around that time then at Netscape that software is eating the world has largely become true and software has eaten the world. Uh, but let's drill down into this a little bit more. What what are the key drivers for digital transformation? And do you want to kick us off, Adrian? Sure. Um, I I think some at some point we were even forced into it. Right, we we had COVID starting um, mm. a few years ago, and organizations were just faced with a situation that they were not used to. Uh, people had to work from home. Uh, we couldn't go to the office anymore. Uh, people were consuming services in a different way. So all the a lot of the manual pieces that, that were happening and the interactions that were happening on the work floor, that just had to change. Um, and, and we saw then also, obviously, from the company that I come from, that in the healthcare, in the financial world, there were a lot of demands on how can we do this? What can we do uh, to, to still serve our customers, to still survive basically this, this period? So a, a lot of things is where, where the big trigger, I, I would say, was that that whole COVID situation. But in the end, for me, behind digital transformation is all how can we do things better, faster, um, cheaper, and still create a better experience for our customers. Um, so obviously for, for a lot of organizations to keep the market share, to stay relevant, um, and, and just be better. I mean, social media does it really well. And on the IT side, um, it seems to be that we're lagging on that experience. So we see a lot of organizations moving into, okay, let's let's create an, an experience for our users that are, is equivalent to how they do things at home. And that's, that's, that's from my side that I see. Happy, uh, yeah, Matt or, or Tama, what do you guys think? Yeah, totally. I think it was a, it, it's out of necessity. Uh, a competitive advantage is digital transformation without question. And it kind of came down to, can you afford it uh, when it was when it was really hard to do? And then it, it became a, a survival tactic in, in the times of COVID. So totally agreed. It, it really drives where you want to be as an organization. And there's so many different flavors that it's, uh, you know, it's hard to figure out what is the right way to do this? How do we want to do this? Is it going to be with our customer data? Is it going to be our internal collaboration? Is it going to be our external collaboration? Lots of different flavors of it. So I, I think you did a good job summarizing why we need it. And there's a lot of variety and diversity out there. Yeah, I, I can I can certainly echo that idea, Matt, and, and, and Adrian, that it was forced upon us. I was on a conference call on a telephone. Oh, sorry, wrong sign, on a telephone. Um, <laughs> But I was on a conference call on a telephone and I was told, we're moving to Teams in, in nine months' time. You'll need to do 16 hours of compulsory training. Um, you know, you'll have to cleanse your data before we move. And we have to have a huge amount of consultation about what kind of team setup we're going to have. And we all went, oh, OK, that was on the Wednesday. On the Thursday, our prime minister stood up and said, all businesses and shops and, uh, and hotels are closing as of tonight. I slept in my car to finish my course. I'm so dedicated. Um, and then as I'm driving back, I get interrupted with another phone call that says, we're going to Teams from Monday morning. And I went, hang on. And here we are, you know, nearly three and a half, four years later. Um, I still haven't had my 16 hours of training, everybody. <laughs> you know, it's no longer been a thing. And I think that illustrates that here we are using Alan Turing's wonderful thinking machine and we still put barriers up, but they're in our heads, not in the technology. 
And it's us that are the barrier, <laughs> not the machines. Most of the most of the technologies were already there. I get told, you know, AI is a key enabler of uh, the digital transformation. And I went, yeah, you've had Cortana in your pocket for 14 years. <laughs> what, what do you mean AI is coming? It's here. Uh, and it's been here for a while, if only you knew how to recognize it. Yeah. Uh, I sometimes tell my students to turn on their loudspeakers, and I just shout, hey, Google, um, and see how many replies you get online. And you suddenly realize that it's already been in our homes for a while. Yet, you know, the barrier in our own head is AI is coming because that's the news we see in the, you know, these key technologies have been there for a very long time. I had a student the other day, Helen, you'll appreciate this one, said to me, oh, you wouldn't know that not being the internet generation. <laughs> excuse me, who built it? <laughs> you know, um, excuse me. Uh, in 1995, when, you know, you, you were setting out, I, I was already doing an operations center in Sarajevo, because I was in the military, <laughs> running networks uh, and, and doing it rather clunkily by today's standards. And I was answering the phone. I was doing service desk. I even did service desk software. Okay, it was Excel with a few macros, but you know what I mean, yeah? Uh, yeah. You know, it was already there. And I think one of the, the problems is recognising that these barriers are in our heads, not in the technology. People are certainly, uh, the culture is certainly, I think, recognised to be the, the biggest barrier often. I do want to pick up, though, there's a general sense then from all of you that there was a big accelerator um, due to the pandemic in digital transformation, whereas... Um, we kind of pointed to 1995 or earlier as the, the generation of the environment that's led to the digital economy. And certainly we can point at people like Amazon as disruptors. And I got the feeling that most of the people on the call felt less like disruptors and more like the disrupted. And I wondered if there was a correlation there between um, the IT operations side of the house, perhaps feeling disrupted. I come from the DevOps world, um, sort of say about 12 years of practicing DevOps. And I've certainly noticed in that world, even though its origins is about bringing agile to IT operations, that there is often um, people say to me things like, well, DevOps is really about dev, isn't it? So I want to ask you guys, is does it feel like ITIL were a bit late to digital transformation party? Was there a big kick in the in the behind with the pandemic? Or was that for everybody, do you think? Matt, do you want to kick us off? <laughs> Such a good question. It is loaded. It is so loaded. Uh, did we get caught looking the other way? Possibly, possibly. I, I think the same can be said of the DevOps movement too. It kind of caught uh, IT operations by storm especially uh, in on the ops heavy uh, side of the house, because we didn't have the same needs or we didn't think that we had the same needs. And I, I'm always going to go back to that ana analogy and, and metaphor of the river. You know, just because you're swimming in the swimming hole at the end doesn't mean that the water's not coming from somewhere, that that water gets added to from somewhere. It's cared for and maintained by someone from somewhere. Um, and we just, I don't know that we had the luxury to be curious enough about, you know, what else is happening upstream? How, how are developer initiatives actually changing um, what we're doing when we're delivering the services? How do, we, how do we allow the river to change very quickly and rapidly without affecting, you know, the size of the swimming pool or the, the swimming hole at the end, the quality of the water. How do we actually do all that stuff? And we, we didn't really necessarily need to pay attention to it until technology caught up with the pace and change of business. The, at that point, then we realized, okay, this river needs to flow. It's got a lot more uh, capabilities. It's got a lot more throughput that we are taking advantage of. And there's ways to foster the 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 water moving along the journey we can get customers to also move upstream with us we can get um, service providers to move upstream with us all the stakeholders can move upstream with us and understand what that river is like and also enjoy the the swimming hole so the, the metaphor is i i hope the metaphor is working um but i i do think that we definitely you know, it's easy to stay focused. So just like the DevOps thing happening to, to ops, I think the same thing is in digital transformation that it's a luxury if you are being able to pay attention to it and do OCM and, and make those changes sticky, so to speak. Um, and I, I'm, I'm glad we're here now. I'll say that much. I, I like your analogy a little bit, Matt, with, with the water part, right? 
the, the thing of the river is that you can see the, the, the size, the banks, right? So you, you kind of know you can go left or right. If you put yourself in an ocean, right in the middle of the ocean, all of a sudden you're still swimming. It's still water, right? So I still didn't change. The, the, the principles are still the same, right? The, the objectives that we have with all of that are still the same. But when you're missing, what, what I see then a lot of organizations, what is missing when you're swimming in the middle of the ocean is that organizations are not giving you the North Star. Right? Where, where, where is land, right? So everybody's swimming really hard, but we're swimming in circles. And at the end of the day, you can be Michael Phelps, but if you keep swimming for hours and hours, you will still drown if you don't reach land at some point. And I think that's kind of, and that's maybe inherited to, to the word disruptors, right? They disrupt things. Otherwise, they're not a disruptor. It's not a new innovation. It's not something big that is coming. But that is what's happening, right? We're, when we're kind of caught off guard, I think, because nobody's telling us where 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 the shore is. Right? So we're focused on the, the now. We're focused on the firefighting. And there's a lot of what, what I see in organizations. There's a, a lot of organizations that are missing those people that have the ability to be innovative, to be visionaries for, for their organization and start thinking out of the box. Right. And, and what we I mean, when I started in IT 40 years ago, we were all outside uh, inside out thinking and to be honest i think most organizations are still inside out thinking right it's all about how do we organize it and sometimes those are the constraints there's financial constraints there is a, a lot of things that it does not control because we're still a little bit the stepchild of, of an organization but that part will will is slowly changing and i think these disruptors like digital transformation are putting us more and more on the map Right. And things like AI. And, and I agree with you, Tom. I mean, our, our, our cell phone. I mean, I started in, 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 uh, in the cell phone industry at some point in the early stages. I mean, those things were clunky, but the more and more power you put in that in that cell phone, that became a very powerful AI. I mean, the thing is listening to me. Alexa is listening to me right now. Right. So it has been there. And I think it's a little bit like the light bulb in a, in a fridge. Right. You only miss it when it's gone. Right. So, and I think the new generation has to realize that the light bulb is already there. You don't have to invent that part anymore. But how are we going to use it? Right? How are we going to apply it in the in the right way and in a successful way that it's maintainable, sustainable for the long term and doesn't disrupt the wrong parts? I mean, uh, in, in the danger of uh, taking analogies too far, yes, we're in the ocean. But I think, uh, Helen, COVID, we're swimming in the ocean, but something brushes our leg. I don't know if anyone's ever done yeah. that. <clears throat> um, but you do get back on the boat really quickly. And, and the bureaucracy was our boat. It, it, was our, yeah. it was our place where we could go and get away from it. And bureaucratic organizations do everything bureaucratically, including IT. Um, and it wasn't the fact that IT, you know, IT was bureaucratic. Nowhere in the IT books, and I've read them over several versions, does it say, and now do this in a long-winded bureaucratic way. <laughs> it doesn't say that in any of the books anywhere um and you speak to the people who wrote it from the itsmf who wrote the stuff and there's no way they're like that it's just if you live in a bureaucratic environment you are just going to your instinct is to create a form for it and make it bureaucratic um, i had an organization come to me once and say can you make our forms more agile and i went no i'm going to tell you to stop using some of the forms and they went <gasps> but to be fair to them they had a form to change or remove a form that's how tight they were into this. Um, and so for them, they were way, you know, from where that was going to be. And it was nothing to do with Agile. It was nothing to do with IT. It was nothing to do with IT, actually, at all. This was the ocean they were swimming in. This was the nature of the ocean. Um, and, you know, for them, the idea that you didn't have a request for change, that you could actually have a self-service portal. And Adrian, you know, and, uh, the, you know, service now, self-service, we'll all be out of a job. No, they weren't. Um, uh, it's just not true. Um, but unfortunately, it's it's the it's the nature of uh, you know we tend to be adversarial. We started saying, "Well, stop not doing this, otherwise it might be insecure," and we all worry because we know that you know was it one in three organisations that have a data breach aren't trading in three years. <laughs> That's one of the <laughs> terrible numbers. Um, and because of that, being driven by fear, which is never a good motivator. I loved it when DevOps was called Agile Infrastructure because I understood it then. Um, because for me, I was in the military at the time. All of our infrastructure was Agile. It came on trucks. It moved around. It, and it got set up. We went to other countries. We did it at the drop of a hat. 
to then find that I could find people who take three years to pan an office move when it was something I used to do every 48 hours. You know, it, it's it's really just realizing that, you know, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. You know, this is a different world. Uh, and some of us, I think probably Matt and Adrian might be this, you are, I'm afraid, the Wizards of Oz behind the curtain that we're all supposed to ignore <laughs> that's making all this thing happen. But the reality, the customers out there for the, that were using computers in the 80s are now using it in the 2020s. They just want it to work. And if it breaks, they just want it to be fixed quickly. That has never, ever changed. Yeah. I think, I think you said something earlier too, Tom, all right, that, that resonates, is that everything, the biggest thing that gets in the way of all of this is people, right? Mm -hmm. it, it is the people that get in the way of, of all this greatness that, that we have. And part of that is even people who want digital transformation, right? It's so, so often their lack of understanding what they're really asking for, what, what it really means to an organization. The things that I run into more than, than not is that everybody of my any of my customers consider this as an IT project, right? Or an IT program, right? It's, it's digitizing, it's infrastructure, right? It's software. And it's so much more than that. And if you don't realize that this is an organizational change that you're doing, an organizational program, and we're, we're basically revamping how we do our business. And if you don't realize that, then you're getting yourself in the way, right? And it, and it goes back to, to thinking about the long-term impact of what we're doing and what you want to achieve, right? So what's the strategy around that? And even if I see organizations that do have a strategy around digital transformation, the, the, the challenge is that they're getting so eager that rather than looking at the reality of things, they're starting to, to respond to their ambition, right? And then they skip the tactical part, right? So not, we're not really planning things out, but we immediately dive into operations. We immediately dive into the execution and, and that breaks everything because now we lost what, what is the upstream effect, what is the downstream effect. We're not connecting the dots to each other. We're not cross, crossing the T's. We're not dotting the I's. Right? And, and in, in the end, everybody's surprised why it's not working. right? Because, I mean, to be fair, like you said uh, earlier, I mean, this is technology. It's 2023. We, we're sending people, to, well, we're sending machines to Mars. right? I, I, I just read about Voyager. It is so far away, it can still ping the earth and it can still find us, right? So it's not the technology that is failing, right? It is on the people side where we don't organize, where we don't think through, that we don't plan for it well enough to make it successful, in, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, and that went up so three much... years after I was born, the Voyager 2. So just to summarize where we've got to so far, we've established that we live in a world that's being digitally transformed. We just, we've established that we're doing that because we want to create better, safer, sooner, happier experiences for all our, our customers. And we've established that there are some things in the way, namely ourselves. Um, but Adrian said something just then that made me want to ask the panel where they think the world currently is in terms of digital transformation, like who's adopted it? How much of the world is digital natives? How far have we got to go? So, Matt, what's your state of humanity in terms of digital transformation? Man, that, that's a tough one. And, and I think the people that really understand it the best are uh, the vendors and consultants, people who are pollinating lots of flowers are going to have a better feel for, you know, what, what the fields look like in different regions. I just had uh, James Gander on from New Zealand on my podcast, and he's, he admitted that he thinks that uh, New Zealand is a little bit behind. They're a little bit slower to adopt. And my, uh, my advice or my, my reaction to it was really like, you, you've avoided a lot of the abuse and trauma that comes with trying to make that transformation happen when it's not ready. Uh, Adrian pointed out <clears throat> that people get in the way. Tom will point out that people get in the way. And it's so much like self-help that you have to want it. You have to want to do the actual work, like losing weight. Yes, you can try a fad diet, but really um, investing in your habits and your patterns and your processes is really going to change who you are not just um, some surface level things. As far as digital transformation and its progress in uh, our industry, man, that is a tough one. And I, I think part of it is because it's an infinite end. It, it doesn't, like you never, who here on this call can say, 
we have digitally transformed. We are at. And it's a really interesting question, isn't it? Sorry to interrupt. So I'm doing some research at the moment with Moogsoft on their second state of availability report, and we asked nearly two thousand respondents exactly that question, and you'd be surprised. So I think it was twenty or thirty percent that said they'd actually digitally transformed, and about ten percent self-identified as digital natives, and the rest were somewhere on the journey. But there's small slice saying they had no plans to. But like you, because I think what you're about to say, Matt, and I'll, I'll stop interrupting, was that Love it's it. one of those moving horizons, right? You're never fully digitally transformed or or what happens in 20 years? Yeah, it's yeah. so much like continual process improvement. Maybe your sales team feels like, oh, thankfully we have a CRM and it's it's working the way we want it to. It fits our teams. It fits our purposes. We're seeing the revenue uh, impacts from it. But then, you know, you talk to marketing and they're, they're feeling a little down. They're like, we don't have something that integrates with the CRM or, you know, our, our campaigns and our advertising doesn't actually integrate well with that. And so you're always going to be finding these little pockets where either people need to integrate better or they're, they're still thinking about the microservices uh, transaction change and the, the, the vendor supplier relationship. My opinion. What do you think, Adrian? I can see the words are on the tip of your tongue. <laughs> All the, to me, the challenge of these questions is always like, what, what, what is the end point, right? What's the end goal? What are, what are we measuring against? Right? And again, this is not a one size fits all. There's organizations just like maturity. They're happy when they're at level three, right? And some organizations want to go to level four, level five. And some say, hey, I don't really care about this. So when we ask about where, what is the state of digital transformation? To me, it's always a question is the organization happy with where they are? Right? It's not a matter of did you digitize everything? It's a matter of did I digitize enough to achieve my goal, to balance the cost with what I get out of it? So what's my return on value? What's my return on my investment? And that's a hard question, right? And to, to what Matt says, I, I, people like consultants and vendors, they, they probably have a lot of insight, but my personal perspective is always, I only see mostly the customers that are in trouble. Right, that don't do it so well. That's why they ask our help. I don't see a lot of organizations that do it great. They don't care about me. They don't need my help. But when 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 I look at it, I th I think it's the help again. I think based also from from COVID, right? And and if I look at the organizations that we helped in the past, in in, in that period, it's a lot of healthcare. It's a lot in the financial world, in the service industry that really have a very tight connection to consumers of the services. Uh, they are a lot more aware of the reasons why we need to do this because it also has a huge impact if they don't, if they are left behind. Right? When I look to public sector, ah, not so much. Right? It's, it's changing. By the way, when I say public se sector, there is the division of those that have interaction with um, the, the, the public. And they are actually really onboarding now. They're going to starting these journeys of, of digital transformation. But those that are not in connection, the, the Department of Defense, yeah, it's all about warfare, right? They, digital transformation, there, there are pockets, but not as much. So I think it really depends on, on the industry and to, to maybe Matt's point, right? I, I don't know if it's by country. It's often driven just also by financial means, right? How, how much do money can I spend? Because we can talk about return on, on value and we can talk about return on investment, but you have to be able to fork up the cost up front before you get the investment back on that, before you get that return. But Tamo. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 don't know. I think I very much um, uh, understand where you're coming from. You know, we think we're crossing canyons, but in reality, we're often pouring money into sinkholes. Yep. <laughs> and we've no idea where the bottom is or how much money or time and effort we've got to pour into them. Uh, and sometimes somebody wakes up one day and goes, we don't need to go that way. Just ignore the hole. <laughs> just, just move on. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's one of the problems that we have is that we're often in an area where there are no paradigms to follow. There are no, you know, we can't join the dots because we're in uncharted waters all the time. Um, and that's natural. That's normal. I mean, I, I came from the defense sector and, and, and you're quite right. Um, you know, they're talking about, you know, it's wonderful. I think science fiction has more to do with it than, than reality. Yet I had to design a uh, system which looked at good old-fashioned rationing, you know, the kind of logistical stuff that no one likes to talk about. And I said, well, how do you show who's been in the cookhouse or not? You know, and it's a one or a naught. And I went, why are we still doing a one or a naught? 
And I went to the National Archives and saw the return after Waterloo. And if you were dead, you got a naught. And if you were living, you got a one. And in actual fact, we were using the same paradigm that was 250 years old. And yet I was told, no, you can't change that. There'll be absolute consternation um, because organizations might think they're fast moving. But in reality, there are there are parts of this. You know, we're still sitting on chairs. You know, we're still you know operating equipment and things which are, you know, thousands of years old. And yet we all think that somebody invented the chair last week and they really didn't. Um, and we fail to understand how sometimes the choices of our forebears, and of course, in IT terms, 1995 is ancient history, Helen. So, you know, they are the ancient Egyptians back then. Um, but some of the choices that were made back then are still constraining us even today. Um, and it's realizing we've broken those constraints. It's almost like we've never read Elia Goldratt's book. You know, we've broken the constraint, but nobody's woken up to it yet. Um, I applied for a car loan. Because, you know, I want to buy a car. I don't want to use the finance that they offer me. I applied for a car loan. My wife said, OK, when are you booking the appointment? You know, when are we taking all of our details? You know, when are we going to take all the forms in? When are we going to go and grovel to that nice woman at the bank? Please, please, please loan me some money. Um, and I said, OK, so I got on the app. Yeah, done. And she went, great. So when are we going? No, 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 I haven't booked the appointment. It, it's done. And she went, oh, so when will we know? Bing. We now know. And she said, oh, so it's been approved. I went, no, no, that was the money arriving in our account. You know, and this happened 40 minutes ago. And this is the world that the digital natives are now living in. And the rest of us are going, why did I want to know that so quickly? You know, what, what, you know it, it, it's I don't changed. know. I'm pretty really happy with that. I had a similar experience recently when I hit, <laughs> part, hit a deer, or should I say the deer hit my car, as the insurers kept on telling me to <laughs> wait there. Yeah. And I took a few snaps of the the, pit, the front of the car because the pedestrian safety system had kicked off. And, you know, it was approved again within 20 minutes. So it was all going to get fixed by the garage and stuff. I mean, it's quite brilliant. It's this new world we live in. Um, we do have our first official question from the audience. There's some great stuff going on in the chat. I really want to come back to some of the conversation about systems thinking and value stream thinking. I think Adrian's kicked off with his references to end to end. But before we do that, I want to get us to kind of refocus on the topic today about how service management drives IT transformation or drives sorry, digital transformation. And participant 272, I've published their question so people can see it and vote on it. Um, have asked what area should IT change look at when it comes to digital transformation, especially when there's a people problem and not following these processes again end to end. So what's your tip, Matt? What should IT change look at? Where do we pick um, to start, particularly around people problems? I think taking them upstream is the first place to start. I love the what concept do you mean that I when you say upstream. Sorry, so we've yes, heard it yes. quite a lot, but people might not understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I'll totally. Uh, and what's great is ITIL four has this concept built into it. The co-creation of value um, is such a simple and elegant addition to uh, an operations framework, and it really is. Um, taking people upstream in a project. So for instance, you're picking laptops, have the customers try the laptops, bring 15 of them into a conference room, um, have them try all of them, have them check their email on them, set them all up, like figure out what it's like and watch them do these things. Um, the, the same can go for other stakeholders, right? Have your field services technicians, the people that are going to be working on the laptops. The same goes for your CRM implementation or, or uh, you know, maybe you've got an HRM uh, application you're rolling out. Having customers and stakeholders as part of the definition of what we're doing, the selection of the tools, the process of implementing, of course, they're going to love it better. It's their baby. You know, for so long, we've built things on our ivory towers and then sent them down and said, you must use these things. It doesn't work to do. And we had OCM for a little while. Org change management is a great concept, too. And of course, we can warm people up for these ideas that we are also shoving down the ivory tower stairs to say, you must use this instead. We have the people with us. We're building these things together. And not only are they going to have their minds and hearts already convinced by the time it comes out, 
but it's theirs. They really feel that ownership and they feel like they're really taking taking their own baby and putting it, it, it to work. Am I, am I off base? Am I living in a dreamland, Adrian? Uh, maybe, but I do, full, I, I do agree with you, right? And I think the, the first part that you said, making sure that IT becomes a part of, of the collaborative efforts, right? I think IT, as you, as you mentioned, I mean, we, we, when I started, it was all shoving down the, the, the users and, and the customers' throats, right? We, we are the all-knowing. We know what we're doing. But the disconnect exists, right? And I think it still exists today, right? The, the disconnect between what the business is looking for, what the customers are looking for versus what we are able to provide. And it it comes with a couple of puzzle pieces that need to start fitting together, right? One thing is to say, that, hey, let me be part of the, of the conversation. And we've been saying that that was already in the 90s, what I remember. We had something called business IT alignment. Right? Oh. And that was the first part where we, hey, we need to be, be part of this. The challenge is, is that you're, you're a toddler wanting to sit at the table of the grown-ups, right? We didn't know what we were asking for, right? We didn't know how to have that conversation with the business. So being part of that also means that you need to look internally to be ready for that. Do I have the right people to have these conversations with, with the business? Do I have the people that understand the impact of what we're trying to achieve? So we need to have, like I said earlier, we need to have people who are innovative, who are creative, who understand what user experience is, that really can sit at the table as equals, as peers with the business and have these conversations. So there's a part of that is, is to me the whole roles and responsibilities. Do I have my, my IT organization set up in the right way to support digital transformation? On itself, the ingredients didn't change. Right? It is. It's still hardware. It's still software. It is still a. It's still ITIL. It's still IT service management. All those concepts are still valid and don't change, but the recipe has changed. Right. The 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 food that the the to to just keep using analogies, the food that people want, has changed. Their palate has changed. So we need to adapt to that, and we need to sit at the table as chefs, and not as a bunch of cooks. Right. And I think that is the biggest thing. And then also start understanding that once we go into this transformation, you do need OCM. Right? When I started about 38 years ago, my first assignment was actually, they said, Adrian, create a communication plan for us. We're missing that. Right? And that's OCM. And still I go into organizations almost 40 years later, and organizations are still not focusing on this piece. Right? How do I enable? How do I communicate? How do I make sure that I have my organization ready to move us into the 21st century, further into the 21st century. And I think that's in addition to what you said, Mike, because I, I fully obviously agree with what you said, but that's that. those are the things that need to happen. Saying is one thing, but action is, is really more important. How do I how do I form myself to that? Tamo, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely, Adrian. I, 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 didn't, I thought the, um, uh, the key thing there is when you introduce communication. Um, I, I spent some time with a guy called Patrick Mayfield who looked at, instead of saying why do projects fail, he looked at why do projects succeed, <laughs> which is a bizarre thing to do. Um, and he looked at what made a, a project or program manager, a change agent, as we, you know, because uh, it's talking about change and that's what it is in our world, what made them successful. And he says they're ambiverts, they're good communicators. It wasn't a control freak gene. You know, there wasn't some great all seeing technical thing. It was just that they were able to relate to people better. And it was the stakeholder engagement that made things look more successful, even when they weren't. And this, you know, the first time I sat at that table and somebody said, oh, what's your return on investment? Well, how long do you write this off for? You know, when do we when does it come in zero on the balance sheet? And we just sat there like fish going up. Uh, and because yeah. we realized we should have bought, we should have bought a fire. Go, go hug someone in finance, somebody, you know, please, please, please come and teach it us. Um, and then you had the numbers, then you had the conversation. But it's this fundamental understanding that that's the way they communicate and that's the way we have to do it. There is no universal translator. That's all Star Trek. You know, there is no universal translator. There's just us. Uh, and we have to learn you know, to swim and, and in, as you use that analogy in the same, in the same river that they're in um, and, and use the same terminology that they use. But also, of course, that that engagement is a two-way street. Yes, we're getting our story out there, but we're also getting it back from them. One of the key practical things you want to take away about change is stop asking for permission. Mm. You know, stop, stop granting. Start saying things like, look, 
this person has asked for this, you know, as a starter, has asked for this set of equipment and rights. I'm going to give it them in five days unless you tell me not to. You know, yeah. we could turn the turn the turn the thing around. The business does not want us to be sat there sitting in judgment, being judgmental, yeah. handing out sweeties. That's not a, that's not the way they want us to be. They want us to be an enabler. They want us. So I'm going to say to you all, look, Adrian has joined the business. He's going to get a laptop. He's going to get access to your data in five days time unless you tell me not to. Uh, that way yeah. it happens, rather than please, 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 can you give Adrian a sign onto your system? Please, 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 can we have, um, please, 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 department, can you give him a laptop? Please, can it be a new one? You know, um, that's that, a whole set of conversations we don't need to have anymore. We, we don't, we shouldn't, but it still happens, right? We're still questioning, like, why does he need a laptop, right? It, it should <laughs> just be, why are we even questioning that? And then I saw yeah. participant 261 and made a comment that I agree with. I And Helen and, and Matt, you uh, to me, you you kind of went down a slippery slope, right? By saying, "Is IT the strategic enabler?" Uh, now we're making ourselves again. We're 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 separating ourselves from from the organization, from the business. I, I think it's collaborative, right? We together find out what the strategy is. We enable it from an IT perspective, but there is a business side to this. There's an organizational side to this. So HR needs to be uh, uh, participating and enabling the strategy. Right. The, the, the business side, the marketing side, uh, everybody has a piece of enabling the digital transformation in the organization. It cannot just be one. We're, we're technology. Right? That, that's what we do. That's what we're best at. But just with tech, I, I, I wrote, I read something that I used quite a bit a long time ago, but it was a statement that said a fool with a tool is still a fool. Right? And I always keep that in the back of, of, of my mind. Yes, we're very good at what we do, if we do it the right way, for the right reasons, at the right time, with the right people. But giving somebody digital transformation and the other side not, not ready for it, not being trained on it, not being enabled on it, not having the right people to support it, maintain it, and execute it, still doing nothing for us. Right? It's just a machine buzzing. So I, I do I want to- I can't agree more. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Uh, I can't agree more because you, you've seen the organizations where 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 users drove the technology decisions. You've got Slack over here. You've got Miro over here. You've got your CRM over here. Everything's in silos because that's the way that humans naturally organize. Like we can't help it. Our little pockets of 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 capability, our little pockets of collaboration all have their own ways of working and will make unique decisions based on the information that they have. IT just gives it a wrapper so that people yeah. can stop and think and say, how do we want this holistically to work? How, you know, we're switching from Google Drive to Microsoft Office 365. We literally have to think long and hard about this, try it out, don't walk too quickly and, and take some of the experience that both our colleagues have and we have and understand how that's gonna work. Yeah, that would be. Yeah, certainly, guys. I think that this idea of um, you know paradigms and experience works to bring them with us. Um, I love the fact that you know um, Excel is just a spreadsheet. Whenever you can make it talk to a database, there's always some in the finance department goes, "Wow, you can do that." To us, it's just a flat file database. It just you know it just looks like the thing they know it, but we know what's behind it is actually pretty much the same. Um, and it just says to people, well, really? Under the hood? Is this just all the same? Yeah, to us it is. But we see it from the technology branch out, and whereas they just see the leaves looking back in. Um, they have no idea necessarily. And, and this is where we do have a role, I think, to be a bit of a force multiplier, because we, we can help them join those dots. We can show them where, where these two things can actually work together, because of the underlying technology is, is actually very, very similar. Um, but for us, uh, how to do that and just not sound like the, the geeky idiot in the room is the trick. How do we do this and actually come across as their helper and not some, you know, which why I think this whole I till, you know, change manager wagging a finger thing just doesn't work. You know, people left school years ago. Why do they put up with that headmasterish sort of, you know, principal uh, approach? We just shouldn't, um, you know. Who do you think you are? Somebody once said, and I said, I'm the person who's here to help you. 
That's who I think I am. I mean, if I'm not that thing, I'll go away. It's fine. Um, and the people went, oh, <laughs> that's all I'm here for, to help. And if I'm not helping, great. I've got plenty of other stuff to get on with. I'm perfectly happy to go and do it. Um, and then people start valuing you for the conversation. Um, I, I did a project team and, um, you know, they, they they were talking about we wanted to value stream map it. And, of course, it was just a, a project plan. They were value stream mapping the, the age old paradigm they fell into. But I said, well, look, if you shift left, you can bring these people forward. And he said, we used to invite cyber to our kickoff. We used to invite the quality people, the Q&A to our kickoff. I said, why did you stop? He says, they asked too many awkward questions. Yet yeah, that's the function. That's why you invite them, <laughs> because you want to have the answers to those awkward questions earlier in the stream. But fundamentally, you know, it, we're treating the symptom of, oh, that was really disruptive. But actual fact, that was positive disruption. That's really what we want to happen, rather than it become the dead hand of, you can't do that. And I think with change management, um, I want to differentiate those people who have a change management process between those people who have a change management process that works. Uh, and those two words make, a, make an acre of difference. Uh, it, it works when you've managed to break that wall and you've managed therefore to do this upstreaming as you might want to call it, but I just calling it, you know, stop checking people. We, we've known this from, um, you know, uh, from W. Edwards Deming, you know, if you just rely on checking to give yourself quality, you'll never get there. You have to build mm. it in. Reliability, uh, sustainability has to be built in. You can't add them on. Reliability is a first-class customer. It is not a topping for your pizza. You can't sprinkle it on at the end. That's not how it works. It, you know, it's not parmesan. You know, we don't just sprinkle it over at the end. Not a bit of pepper. Yeah, it's, it's got to be. It's, it's got to be built in. Yeah. yeah, it's great you're talking about some of those illities because we've got another uh, question from the audience actually, which is uh, speaking to some of that, which is about, of course, our classic metrics and KPIs or our key performance indicators. So. Which ones, Tomo, should we be using to measure the success of specifically service management driven digital transformation projects? So which are the key metrics in this scenario? I, I think the one that we, that we never really look at, which is how many hypotheses have we killed off? What do you mean by killed off? So how many things have we tried and rejected? How many things have we mm -hmm. discovered? What learnings have we got? We virtually, we all talk about lessons learned like it's a thing. Um, but actually, it's normally just at best lessons recorded, at worst lessons ignored or forgotten. Um, the reality is, if you're going to be transforming, which means we're going to be in a different place than where we were, what have we rejected? What have we learned along the way? What have we found out about ourselves? We never really measure that as a KPI. It's never really a thing. Um, but I think the number of hypotheses tried, you know, and um, the learnings that we take from that is something we should track. Because then we'll start giving it resource. We'll actually say we need to dedicate some time to try this out. You know, um, I'm a cricket fan. You don't become a great batsman just by walking out there and playing cricket. You become a great batsman by spending plenty of time in the nets. Yeah. <laughs> you don't become a, a great baseball player just by playing matches. You become a great baseball player by just swinging and missing and swinging and missing. We're not recording the swingings and miss. Uh, and we're sort of they're getting the idea that that's failure and waste when it is not waste, not if you're learning from it. Yeah. And so if I could change one thing is I would get people to understand that learning is a metric. I think that's something really we can get better at. Yeah, in IT ops, we don't see a lot of that. I mean, experimentation and empirical evidence and those kind of things are, you know, deeply woven into software agile development, but not so much in IT ops. So that would definitely be refreshing. Matt, what would you say from a metrics and KPIs to measure, again, specifically this, uh, this uh, service management driven digital transformation initiative? I don't like the word project. Yeah, I think it's a great, great question. And I hate the answer. It depends, but it really does make sense because um, in some organizations, what you're trying to overcome is different than others. You, you might have command and control already. So like measuring how much command and control you have probably isn't what you're looking for. Maybe you're looking to improve employee experience. Maybe, the, maybe you've got high agent turnover and that's what you're trying to solve. 
So what is their experience like? You know, how are they involved in the the day-to-day ticket interactions, the change interactions, the the things coming down the ivory tower? Are they getting their knowledge written for them? Are they, you know, are they getting handover during service transition? I think those are those are the things that really organizations need to think about before they start choosing their KPIs. Because there's always going to be the obvious ones. And this is actually one of the places where I I recommend people use ChatGPT and and large language models to determine what metrics are going to be important to you. Because you can have a so-called conversation with a lot of consultants about this and say to the AI consultant, you know, I I have a problem with this, uh, with my organization doing this. What what KPIs should I be using to measure it? So it could be total cost of ownership. Maybe your service management platform costs too much or has too much overhead. So maybe that's the one that you're going to focus on, total cost of service management. Um, or maybe it's uh, maybe it's your NPS. Maybe you're going to use the the fateful NPS score to determine, you know, how are, how is your initiative doing? Would you recommend this incident process to a family or friend? <laughs> uh, but really, those NPSs they're really great at opening the door and having a conversation, and again, inviting the people upstream into the service management realm to have that conversation to say, you know, is this actually working for you? Uh, or are we are we headed down the wrong path? Um, I didn't give a lot of good good KPIs and metrics there, but I kind of did it on purpose. Uh, did you did you catch that? <laughs> I I also have to agree with you, Matt. Right, so it's 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 typical consulting answer, but it it works in this case. I think we often see organizations jump too quick into operational metrics. You have to not not to preach here to to a group, but you have to look at metrics and reporting as there's a strategic side to it, a tactical side to it, and there's an operational side to it. And those dots need to be connected. And in the end, they need to be connected to the the strategic outcomes that the organization is seeking, right? What are the outcomes that we're seeking by doing digital transformation as as a solution to this, right? Digital transformation is a solution with with uh, a means to an end, right? So it's what, what am I seeking as an organization? What are the outcomes? What are the critical success factors in order to achieve those outcomes? And then based on that, I make my key, uh, performance indicators, and then I have my operational metrics that help me basically um, turn the dials up or, or down a little bit to to get to that point. Uh, but in the end, when 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 we were looking for it, it, it's again, did I achieve what I was being asked to do? So, am I doing it? Are we doing it better? Um, are we streamlining streamlining it? Are we making it easier for for our users? Are we making it more accessible? Did we do it cheaper? Do we do it more effective? Are we doing it more efficient? So all of these things you need to have in the back of your mind. And again, find out for each organization which one is the most applicable to, to get those outcomes. And I'm sure you can Google it and, and chat G, GPT it um, with coming metrics out of a box, right? That these are the things to measure. But you have to have the ability to link those metrics then to the goals that you are trying to achieve. And don't overdo it, right? That is one thing also. It's not the question that you asked, but... I was, you only need three, four, five metrics to see if I'm achieving my goal. Right? And, and I think the important part that I always, when I was very heavily in, in ITIL in, in the beginning, there was one process that was, was missing for me, and it's called perception management. Right? It is always, how do I manage the perception of the people who are receiving the service that I'm, that I'm providing? I don't have to be scientifically correct. Right? It's not about having 99.99% availability. It is about, is the service there when they needed it, whether it was 98% or whether it was 99.9999%. doesn't matter. But it's the same with digital transformation. Am I creating a perception on the business side that gives me a thumbs up? Right? This is great, guys. Right? And that is important with the measurements that I'm taking. Right? Am I doing the right things for you? And what do I need to do to make that happen? And that connection of metrics is, is what you need to seek. And again, it's a very consultative answer but it is different for any organization. I was going to say somebody said something really intelligent in the chat, but it turned out to be Matt, but it's still intelligent. <laughs> it's just that success looks different to everyone. Yeah. And the best teams capture lots of measures while still focusing on key interface. We only have five minutes left. Can you believe that? We have another question from the audience, so I really think we should try and answer. 
Um, Adrienne, I'm going to ask you to start us off this time. And the question is about skills. So the participant is saying that all the skills we've been talking about are really interrelated. ITIL does give us a structure, but we're still struggling to relate these roles that have different skills. Agile mindset that is required for us to do digital transformation is still challenging. So how can we deal with all this kind of confliction and complexity and come out the other side? Oh, as Matt would say, that's a very good topic. Yeah. But it's, it's very important, right? Again, I, I, I see organizations really not focusing on the skill side of the house. And I'm not promoting anything, but I am very fond of this, uh, the, the, the SFIA framework, right? The skills framework for the information age. Mm -hmm. I think organizations should look at something like that. It doesn't matter which framework you're using, but start stop thinking about, I need to be a Java developer. I need to be this or I need to be... Start thinking more about what are the skills that I need, and not only from from a technical perspective, but also from an organizational perspective and a business perspective, and line those skills up, and then find out what who are the people that I need for that. And one of the things that I was thinking about with when Tomo was talking is that um, we we often see that that people, especially within IT, we're just oh who who is not busy 120 percent of the time ah. So that's how I became an IT contingency manager, right? It's not because I was very good at, 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 at business continuity. It was I wasn't busy 120% of the time. Right? So I had some room in my calendar to do these things. And that is the challenge, right? Define your skills, define your, define your responsibilities, define your skills, and then match it with the right people in the organization. And once I have my responsibilities and the skills that I need, then you need to create, in my mind, a, a, an enablement plan for, for your organization. And that enablement plan has to match up with your, with your roadmap on how we are rolling out digital transformation in the organization. So don't, don't train people too, too early, because then they will forget stuff, but certainly don't, don't do it too late. It's all about the right timing and the alignment of enablement of skills in the organization with what you're trying to achieve as, as that organization. Perfect. With the interest of time, I'm going to lay down a challenge for David, or Tomo, should I say, which is to give us his key takeaway in 60 seconds or less, and I'm counting. I think the, the, the key takeaway is building on what Adrian just said. Um, fundamentally, um, we can't just use turn-up ability as a criteria as to who should do a job. Um, we should be confident... If I tell just one story in 60 seconds, I said to somebody, you need to train your guys in this. And they said, but if I train them, they'll leave. I says, there is something worse. He says, what's that? He says, you don't train them and they stay. Yeah. And that's fundamental. We've got to realize that whatever skill set or mix you have will be for today, for now, not forever. I love you that. and your ability is forever. Um, and so it's not mindset. Mindset's too individualistic. That, that's really culture. We should stop using the term agile mindset. That's too much on the individual. The problems we have are systemic, not individualistic. It's for those who curate the system to make it navigable by the human beings. Perfect. Matt, you get the final word in 60 seconds or less. What would you like to leave the audience with? Broaden your horizons. Diversify what you're thinking. Uh, Adrian, I love the Sophia call out. I, I want to add partner with your learning and development teams in HR. They really understand people more than more than IT does. I hate to say it, but it's true. Uh, and diversify. This is this is the point of DEI is is to take and hire a lots of different mindsets and lots of different people and lots of different ways of thinking and then leveraging that to your advantage. Um, so that. It doesn't seem like it's related, but um, all the answers to these questions just keep coming back to explore lots of different frameworks, lots of different thinking, and lots of different people's networks. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So thank you, audience, for joining us today to consider the relationship between service management and digital transformation. A very big thank you to our panelists, Adrian, David, Tomo, and Matt. Next up in the ITSM programme on the 9th of August is how service management helps drive sustainability and the registration page is pinned in the chat. So I'll give you a chance to get to that and click on it while I asked everyone to say thank you and goodbye. Thank you, guys. And Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great week. Bye for now. Cheers.